Hello, everybody online. We are just waiting for the start time. You are in the right place for the public health meeting. We got different ringtones on the phones. Oh. Like on Dennis's phone, it, when it's his wife, it rings like it's better answer. <laughs> <laughs> I have different pictures with different people because because your I, picture appears on there. Well, no, I have like no, different I icon pictures. Yeah. Darth Vader or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And my daughter's a giraffe because she loves giraffes, and my grandson is like a little robot because he's all into that. And well, the reason I did it was because I'm on my Bluetooth a lot on my in the car, and then it's really easy for me to oh you look over oh that's my daughter you know I'm just like. Really? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, good. My mic works. I was worried. <laughs> good, morning, good morning, Blair. Morning. Our dog barks. When they, when he hears, she hears something and she barks so loud. Whatever. Yeah. That's not your favorite neighbor right there. Sign an autographs. Any autographs? <laughs> Most of the Nobody uses the hand sanitizer. And that no, nobody is supposed to be there. I just did. When I came in, I thought, don't say nobody. I, I, I regret oh. no. That bothers me that you called me a nobody. <laughs> and he was already here. Um, I went there this morning. Yeah. Uh, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> Shows a app. Oh, yeah. This goes everywhere. Okay. <clears throat> things have been spilled in here. <clears throat> I've seen things get spilled in here before. So. Uh, Alan Thomas Silver. Oh, yeah, he said it. Can rename him. Good morning, everybody. Um, the time is 9 a.m. I'd like to call to order the um, meeting of the Public Health Committee. 
Please call the roll. Silva? Alan? Silva, I'm here. Oh, thank you. Alan present. Good morning. Danian? Here. Sanchez? Here. Thomas? Here. Weber? Present. Yes. Everybody's here. Yeah, everybody's here. Thank you. Good morning. Um, now, I first order business as approval of the minutes from September 16th. Mr. Sanchez first and Mr. Kenyon second. Um, need a roll call? You're the busiest person. Kenyon? Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Silva? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weber? Yes. Yes. Alan, I. We can't remember. It's okay. We got it. Good morning, Deborah. Good morning, Madam Chairman. Thank you. All right. Um, um, finance budgets are on our attachment. Um, any questions? Okay, then we'll move right along. Um, I don't believe that we have any public comments on agenda <laughs> items. Okay, we'll go past that. Um, I'd like to jump ahead and do animal control and let Brett give his presentation because I think um, the um, information from the director is gonna be quite lengthy this morning. So Brett, if you'd like to go ahead. <laughs> Brett Youngstead. Sorry, having muting issues. How is everybody this morning? Oh, wonderful. I asked if you Very would good. do your report first. No, not a problem. I had muting. I had trouble unmuting. I apologize. Phone no, issue. Not a problem. Good morning. You guys moved too, too fast for me. Good morning, everyone. So we had our last and final vaccine clinic um, this last Wednesday, ten fourteen. Uh, I'm proud to say we vaccinated three hundred and forty three dogs. 76 cats and did 52 microchips. This is actually some of our highest numbers ever. And next month I'll have a full uh, detailed report from you of the breakdown of everything because we really did see a high number, 104 seniors for dogs and 34 seniors for cats. And again, that's what we do this clinic for. We're very excited we're able to uh, get them through because again, we do the free tags here in Kane County for the seniors, so we're very excited for that. Um, other thing I have for you this month is you'll notice that our expenses exceeded our revenue. Looking at this year's budget, um, we all know COVID has really impacted us um, severely. We're averaging $120,000 shortfall so far in the year with two months still to go. We're still doing everything we can. We've lowered our expenses. Um, we're still ensuring the animals get everything they need. Um, we've just cut back in other areas of things that uh, like work that was supposed to be done on the building. Um, we're looking to purchase a trailer for uh, horses, didn't get done this year. So we cut out a lot of things in our budget that weren't mandatory um, to ensure that the animals that do come through here. We're still in the positive for the year, um, but I just wanna make sure the board is aware that we're averaging about $120,000 loss and we're expecting on average, because we're losing about $10,000 a month, uh, we're expecting to end the year at about $140,000 loss, but we should still be fine, um, not require any assistance from the, gov from the county, um, but I do want to ensure that the board is aware at all times of what's going on. Thank and that's you. all I have for you this month. Okay, thank you. Yeah, understood about the financials, but thanks for- I have a question. Second. Yeah. Um, Kenyon has a question. How many horses do you think you're going to haul in a year? It, so the reason we did it is last year we had six horses um, sitting in unincorporated. We had to wait for rescue groups for assistance. Um, our biggest issue is not that our rescue group partners are not fantastic. It's sometimes their trailers are down. Sometimes their trailers are being occupied. Sometimes they're having other issues with trailers. Um, so we'll sometimes one, one time we sat with horses all day. So what we were trying to do is to purchase a trailer just so we had it prepared not only for horses, but if we had to move equipment at the same time. Um, so it was a dual purpose trailer uh, that would be ready for use for the county. It was just one of those things we had budgeted. We were trying to do again, 
we thought it would be our job is to pick up stray animals. Unfortunately, sometimes horses fall into that category. So we've had a lot of times where in my over six and a half years here, we've had some issues with it. Um, so it was nothing more than trying to ensure the county is prepared. And that's my job here. And that's what I was trying to do. Good answer, man. Good answer. You ever need a trailer? I have one. Oh, thank you. I actually really do appreciate that. And I will let you know. We could contract, you know. All right, thank you. No, he much. offered it for free. <laughs> yeah, for free. Oh, Jerry, 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 I forgot, Jerry. Um, any other questions before we let Brett go? I do have a quick quick question. This is Dr. Silva, uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, uh, briefly, and you can tell me if I if we need to speak about this, um, Brett, uh, independently. Uh, just checking on the welfare of the animals right now, just doing a check um, during COVID. Uh, and would you be open to a fostering program if, um, if we need be? We're actually doing fantastic. Um, we've really renewed our partnership with Anderson and Anderson has been fantastic with us. Um, they've helped us move a bunch of animals here that were sitting for a little while. Um, number wise, we're actually doing great. Eight dogs, 10 cats right now. Um, believe it or not, we're having a little ramp up of kitten season. So we have two kittens that are going up for adoption today. Um, adoptions have been wonderful. Um, we've been doing them very, uh, as organized as possible we can for COVID to ensure that no one contracts or comes in contact with anybody else. Everybody wears masks because our front lobby is still shut down. Um, we're working everything through the parking lot. But again, um, the citizens of Kane County have been amazing for adoptions. Uh, rescues are still up. We're doing fantastic in that aspect. Um, I have space because we are prepared if we need to take an animal or two in or if we need to emergency board animals somewhere else. Um, so no, we're actually doing wonderful. The animals here are doing great. Like I said, we cut out a lot of the expenses of things we didn't need to do this year. Um, some doors were slated to get renewed. Some things were uh, slated to get fixed this year. Priorities went to the animals. Um, they always will go to the animals. I will always ensure that and the animals have everything they need here. And um, we've even gotten two donations from Kong um, through a raffle program that they run. And we've received extra Kongs this year. So we've done extra peanut butters and Kongs. We do uh, frozen uh, chicken soup with a treat inside. So no, the animals are doing fantastic. And that Girl Scout, Scout project I brought to you last uh, month has been wonderful for enrichment of the animals. So no, our animals are doing great and I appreciate the question. Thank you so much. And um, uh, I, I um, have one other question. Uh, my, I do give out my cell phone number and sometimes I get phone calls and text messages from the constituency pretty late at night and this happens to be one. Um, so it's important. Uh, do we do anything with um, uh, an wild animals that could possibly have distemper? This is from a constituent who thinks that the, the animal has the, has the symptoms of distemper, not sure, but um, I, I didn't think that we would go out and do anything about it. Could you correct me if I'm wrong, please? Sure. It, it depends on what exactly is going on and where the person is located. So, of course, animal control's responsibility is unincorporated King County. We do go out for sick and injured animals. If it's in city limits, we refer them to the police department or their local city hall. They would be the ones to give us approval. And, yes, we will pick up sick and injured raccoons and skunks uh, skunks will be submitted to the state for testing of random testing of rabies. Um, we have seen a high number of wildlife recently, especially in the past two months, um, of sick animals out there. Um, we yeah, believe them to I'm be hearing. distemper. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm with you. We believe them to be distemper. So what I tell people is if they have a sick or injured animal on their property, to give us a call and let us kind of work through it with them. The things we don't do are deers and coyotes. Though they're protected by Department of Natural Resources. Um, right now, there's a situation in Batavia of a coyote that has severe mange. We've alerted Department of Natural Resources. Our local um, conservation officer has, is aware of it. Um, they continue to monitor it, but there's not much they step in for. Um, but we do ensure the public, reassure the public every time they call us that it has been given to the proper authorities. And the ones who have control of this are alerted to it. So we have no, our job here is to educate. So if people have a question, I always ask them to please call us because I'd rather work through the question with them so they can get the answer that they need. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, I stand corrected. I will take care of that. And um, 
and let you know if we need further assistance. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, of course. Again, the bulk of our job is education here and I wanna make sure that people get it. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none and seeing none, well, let's move along. Thank you very much, Brett. Thank you and sorry about that mute issue. Oh, not a problem at all. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for your information. Of course. Um, so we'll move right along to um, Dr. Jeffers, who I know has a lot of information. So let's just jump right in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Chair. Uh, well, we still have COVID, so. Uh, but in the essence of time, I've asked one of my staff, uh, April Elliott, the Assistant Director of Communicable Disease, to give you a quick presentation on some work that they are doing. Um, as you know, it's all hands on deck at the health department and um, she has, uh, she's very instrumental in, in a lot of our successes and she's very busy. So I would like her to go in front, if you don't mind, uh, Marcus, of me and let her uh, get her uh, presentation out of the way, answer any questions that you might have, and then she can um, move on and not have to set through my presentation because you are right, we have discussions. Yes, that's the school one, thank you. Uh, April, you will be uh, unmuted and will be on the line and um, your, your presentation slide is uh, on the screen if you can see it. Hopefully you can see it. April, yes, this I is Mark. If you, if you wouldn't mind, just tell us when to advance the slides. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, yes, thank you. Um, today I'll talk to you guys uh, how we've been working with our schools here in Kane County, um, obviously as it relates to COVID-19. Um, so thank you for having me here again. My name is April Elliott, Assistant Director for Communicable Disease. Next slide. So what you see here are the um, school districts that we have in Kane County. So you see a total of nine public school districts that we uh, work with. We also work with um, private schools that reside in Kane County, universities, colleges that reside in Kane County, and any um, early learning daycare facilities that um, are reside in Kane County. So we are working closely with our schools um, and, and others within the, um, the uh, early childhood to you know, university uh, college age group. Next slide, please. So for our, our public and our private schools, for sure, um, there are three different types of learning statuses that they are in. Um, we have primarily our schools are in remote or the hybrid learning status. So hybrid is partial remote or in person. Uh, we do not have any of our public schools that are currently 100% um, in person. Um, our private schools also um, are majority in hybrid or in person. Um, if, if they are in person, they do have the option for um, some of the kids to uh, remote into, into school for their learning as well. Next slide. So our, our team, we support our schools uh, with doing contact tracing. Uh, we are doing contact tracing within the school setting. Um, so we are working very very closely with the schools and engaging um, in contact tracing in the schools, identifying if students are um, being exposed um, or if staff are being exposed. Um, and so in doing that, we, we, there's a contact tracing course that has been provided by the Illinois Department of Public Health. And we do strongly recommend that um, staff that are involved in assisting uh, with uh, identifying or working with the health department closely for contact tracing that they themselves are taking the contact tracing course. Um, this does truly help them to feel more confident as they're assisting us and working with us. Um, and then it also um, better helps them understand contact tracing um, as a whole and, and why we're doing it and how we do it. Um, and that, that has uh, shown to uh, be very, very beneficial. Uh, I, I would say that with Geneva School District, all of their health staff completed the contact tracing course. 
um, and it and it does show a tremendous difference between you know one school that has completed it and the other that has not. Um, we receive reports of cases and close contacts, so we've set that up um, electronically, so schools are able to report any cases they become aware of and close contacts to those cases to us electronically. We try to uh, create a way for schools to communicate with us um, in a way that is not uh, as burdensome on them. Um, we want to recognize that they, uh, you know, are, this is a huge impact on them and the time that they are um, addressing COVID within their building. So we try to come up with ways that reduce them having to sit on the phone with us when it's just, you know, them reporting information. And again, we're, we've been working with them so closely, they know the next steps that are in place. Uh, we also work with them for providing interpretation of guidance. So making sure that they understand the guidance that is coming out um, at the state level um, and helping to answer any questions that they have in regards to the guidance. Um, there's been multiple changes, especially to the uh, exclusion chart, which you'll be able to see in the, um, a couple of slides following. Uh, but in that exclusion chart, there have been some changes. So um, with those changes, questions come up because it is how they handle kids um, that are symptomatic in school and how to address them um, being away from the school. We also help to provide updated guidance. So, um, you know, just as I mentioned before, guidance is changing. We're making sure that they have what's updated. And we do that by working closely with the Regional Office of Education here in Kane County. So providing that information to the Regional Office of Education and, and they're pushing it down to the districts. Um, we also help with identifying and monitoring outbreaks. Um, so in a in a school setting, an outbreak would be considered two confirmed cases um, that are epi-linked. So when we mention epi-linked, that means same place, same time. They don't have any close, they have no exposure outside of school um, and are not identified as a close contact to a case um, outside of the school setting. Um, if a school does have an outbreak in a particular classroom, uh, we address, we identify that and address that outbreak within that classroom and monitor that outbreak. Um, for an outbreak to be considered, um, to be considered complete and over, um, there is a need to have 28 days or two incubation periods um, of no additional cases. Um, and so have we had outbreaks in schools? Um, we have had at least, um, three that I'm aware of, but it is, it is, it is just in one particular classroom. Um, and so when we're, if we have an outbreak in a school, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the school needs to shut down and it doesn't necessarily mean that the classroom needs to shut down. Again, it would be just two cases in that classroom that are, we're not able to link outside of the, outside of that um, classroom. Um, and so we work with the school um, to monitor and mitigate that outbreak. Um, we also provide consultation for general inquiries and, and, and closures. So again, this is going back to the guidance um, and how to apply that guidance. Um, you know, with us going, uh, with King County being a, at a warning stage, uh, we are getting a lot of inquiries on whether or not, you know, our school should close or not. So we talk through that with them. Uh, we are not necessarily, we're not going to close a school um, unless there, you know, it's uh, an outbreak, but we do provide consultation with them so that they can make the right decision for their students, their staff, for their district. Next slide, please. So our schools are doing a tremendous job. Um, they're doing a lot of work to protect um, all the students and all of their staff. Um, they're doing a tremendous job on social distancing to the best of their ability. Um, and when we mention social distancing, we're talking about at least six feet um, or more than that. So they are constantly, um, I mean, I've had schools where, you know, they're measuring out and making sure that the desks are six feet apart. Um, they're also um, doing universal masking, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, um, just reminding 
staff and educating students and staff about hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. The great thing is, is that, you know, kids are doing a great job wearing masks. Um, and so if they're, if they do cough or something like that, um, we do have that source control there. Um, and I, I just want to mention again, kids are doing a great job wearing masks. We have kids that are, um, that have maybe some sensory issues that schools are working with to help them become um, able to wear masks. So they are continuing to work with them to wear their mask, but overall in general, kids are doing a great job wearing masks. Um, our schools have a great um, cleaning and disinfecting protocols that they have in place. They're cleaning and disinfecting in between um, use of the classroom throughout the day. Um, and also um, every night they're doing deep cleaning. So if there were a case in the building that cleaning and disinfecting is happening throughout the day and um, overnight as well, which does help to reduce the need to close a classroom for a length of time because they're doing the cleaning and disinfecting, um, their frequent cleaning and their deep cleaning daily. We talk about cohorting. So cohorting teachers and students to um, a particular classroom. It, this can be difficult when we are talking about middle school or high school because they are moving um, from classroom to classroom. Um, but for the most part, for our uh, elementary levels, they are able to cohort. When we talk about our daycares, they're able to cohort. Um, so that's, that's pretty vital um, to make sure that um, we are reducing the impact should someone um, end up being, uh, you know, testing positive for COVID or having symptoms of COVID in a particular classroom. Um, they're engaging in symptom screening and monitoring on site. And um, they also are, have certification process in place for parents to um, certify before their child attends school. They're certifying that their child is without any symptoms. Um, and if their child is presenting with symptoms then the schools are providing the parents what the next steps are. Um, as it pertains to the exclusion um, guidance that we will go over in a couple of slides. Um, also isolation and quarantine is one preventative measure um, that they are taking as well. So making sure that students, if they do become ill while at school, that they're isolating them properly. Um, and then, and again, that those kids who are symptomatic or test positive for COVID that they are not coming to school. And if there's any kids that are identified as close contacts because of an outside exposure, or if in, even if it were to be in school, that those kids are not attending school and are quarantined at home as well. And then also ongoing education on preventative measures. I don't think that we can um, re reiterate them and reinforce them enough. Um, you know, during this whole time of COVID, it's, it's sort of um, reduced you know, what we normally would do in life. And so, you know, some of us are getting a little tired and wanting to sort of um, relax a little bit. So the ongoing education is, is vital to uh, reinforce and to remind not only staff and students, but just the general public that, you know, we still need to be in this together and do um, the preventive, preventative measures that we need to do to help reduce the impact of COVID. Um, in schools and in the community. Next slide, please. Some challenges that are faced by schools, um, the exclusion guidance for symptomatic individuals um, does um, have criteria for uh, testing of students. And, um, you know, one challenge that was faced with the testing of students is that, you know, the physician has an, uh, an option to test the child. So if they give an alternative diagnosis, um, that's not necessarily saying that there's no COVID, that's just saying that the kid has an alternative diagnosis. So we've seen some diagnosis of viral um, respiratory infection or allergies. And what we know is that these, you know, symptoms that mimic those of allergies or other upper respiratory infections um, can be COVID. And the only way to rule out COVID is to test for it. Uh, we've seen kids who have vomited one time and test positive for COVID, or they just had very, very mild allergy-like symptoms and they tested positive for COVID. Um, so it goes to show that even though symptoms may be very, very mild, which is what we see in kids, we still want to make sure that we're testing 
um, to identify whether or not it is COVID. Another challenge that they are facing is non-school related events and not adherence to guidance. Um, I will say that because our schools are doing so well, we are not seeing um, exposures happening within the school setting. Um, and I, I would say that's probably about 90% of our cases that are in school, 90 to 95% of our cases that are, are identified as school, um, school cases, those, those cases are exposed outside of the school setting. Um, so exposure is happening outside. And why is that happening? We have social gatherings that are going on. There's um, tra those travel sports teams or private sports teams that are outside of the school setting. And we just have, you know, we have some in the public that are just not adhering to guidance. Um, and so that does impact what it may look like in schools because we have kids going to school who may be testing positive or we might have kids going to school who have someone at home who is presenting with COVID-like symptoms or they're waiting for uh, test results. And then when they test positive, that's when they're saying they need to keep their kid at home. Um, so that continues to be an ongoing struggle and we continue to educate the public about what they need to do um, to help our schools stay open and be a safe place. Um, and then also, in addition to that, compliance with isolation and quarantine within the household. So um, it's, it's really important that when we have um, household members, any household members who test positive, that they truly are keeping that person isolated away and then quarantining the rest of the household. Um, and, and that's important because we don't want ongoing exposure with that person who, who has COVID. Um, quarantine doesn't start until you're, you have um, stopped being exposed. So um, that can be difficult, um, especially in our younger age groups where parents are the main caregiver. Um, and so if that parent were to test positive and that child is considered a close contact and is, would not start their quarantine until their parent is released from isolation. So, um, we are trying, we are working with the schools and working with parents to understand that component that their child cannot come back, um, you know, until, until their quarantine is completely over. And I do believe that parents have now are starting to grasp that and understand, and they really are, we're starting to see that they really are working on trying to keep, um, you know, their kids separate from anyone else in the household who may test positive. Um, so that their child is able to go back to school sooner. And then also we have interpretation of travel guidance and quarantine. So the travel guidance, um, and we follow the travel guidance as on the CDC website, um, you know, it sort of leaves it up to us to determine whether or not um, it's safe for someone to return to work or return to school after traveling because we need to be looking at um, positivity rates, um, if, you know, if they go to Texas or Florida or wherever, um, looking at those positivity rates compared to what we have here and deciding whether or not um, if, if quarantine is, is necessary. So we do get lots of questions um, about whether or not someone needs to quarantine after um, traveling. Next slide, please. So I do apologize, this slide is a little bit blurry, um, but this is our um, interim exclusion guidance. And I will say that this uh, is in the process of being um, updated by the state. It's in, final, it's in a final review for the updates that are there, but this is the chart that is used for any kid that presents with symptoms um, while they are at school. So if you um, look at the top box where it says sit home or deny entry, um, those are the symptoms that um, the school would be looking at uh, to determine if a kid needs to go home with COVID-like symptoms. Um, and then based on whether or not that child is tested or if they go to the doctor and receive an alternative diagnosis, this chart will help, that, will help the school understand what they need to do next. Um, and it also goes as far as to when, when we would begin to do contact tracing 
um, and, and also um, what documentation they need in order to return to school. Um, and so they have this here to review with them. And so, you know, as this changes, we are constantly in communication with our schools to talk about those changes and how it may impact the schools. This chart here it had, has the schools, um, uh, it has caused a lot of issues um, just because of the test. Um, before this guidance came out, we were able to accept a negative antigen rapid test um, as a way for a child to return back to school. However, when this guidance came out, it stated that a PCR negative test was required. And so we are seeing um, issues with that because most of our kids are receiving the rapid test um, and testing negative with a rapid. So if they need a PCR, they're still not able to return to school until they get that PCR um, negative test. So that's an issue that the state has actually rectified in the um, updated guidance that we are pending to receive, um, hopefully soon. Next slide, please. So on the back side of the chart that I just showed you is also the supplemental guidance. And this is for school nurses and for healthcare providers. Um, it just provides some additional guidance to them when, when deciding what to do with a child who is preventing, presenting with COVID-like symptoms. We really want, um, even though we have the guidance there as to what to do, there's still an assessment component that the nurse and the provider need to do on their end. Um, and when we talk about the school nurse, you know, they, they do know these kids. So if, if it were a kid that has, for example, migraines and that's their baseline, um, perhaps, you know, they would be looking at other um, assessment pieces to determine whether or not that it, it's, if that child should be um, going home or not. The next slide, please. And I've also put here the uh, risk levels for sports. Um, we are working with our schools very closely on their, on their sports and um, uh, making sure that, you know, there's supervision. It's, you know, there's some sports where, you know, kids are playing and they may not, um, we just wanna make sure that the coaches are supervising and making sure that kids are socially distancing themselves, wearing their mask um, at all times when appropriate during that uh, play of sport. Um, and again, I just wanna point out that our schools are doing an awesome job and we are not seeing exposures here happening in the sports when they're in, uh, related to school sports. We're seeing the exposures happening with the private setting sports. So sports clubs, that's where we're seeing um, exposures happening. So our schools are doing a really good job in supervising and making sure that kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing um, prevent prevention wise um, when it comes to playing the sports. But we are working with them um, closely uh, on the sports and making sure that um, depending on which level they fall into, that they're engaging in the appropriate level of play. Some sports are not able to compete against other teams. Some sports are able to. Those that fall in the low risk are able to do some competition because they uh, have a significant less contact um, when playing the sport. Next slide. We have the adaptive and pause guidance um, for our schools. Um, and so we follow the county level metrics that you see here um, provided by the state. And so this is what we would reference for our schools to look at when deciding whether or not they need to um, adapt their learning mode. So um, going back and forth between remote, hybrid, or in-person. And again, right now our schools are up to hybrid. So at this point, they would be deciding whether or not they need to go um, remote. We are in favor of our schools, um, you know, continuing um, hybrid right now because what we, we are not seeing an increase of cases in, in zero to 19. And we are, not, we are seeing the bulk of our cases that our school age cases, they are being exposed outside of the school setting. And so we need to work with our public to um, to engage in safe practices to, so that our kids can remain in school. Next slide, please. 
So again, I think I've already said this earlier that our schools are typically reporting cases that are exposed at social gatherings, club sports, workplaces, um, and then also within their household. And again, um, if there is an outbreak identified, a, an outbreak would be two cases, two confirmed cases that are epi-linked. So same place, the same time. So you can have two cases in a classroom, but we have to identify where they exposed outside of the classroom. Um, and if they were exposed outside of the classroom and were a case as a result of that exposure, then that would not be considered an outbreak. If they were exposed, let's say one student um, was exposed outside of school and perhaps exposed a student in their classroom and that student they exposed became a case, um, then we would consider that an outbreak. Next slide, please. Um, so here's our school support team. We have Truly Wiley, who is our school uh, COVID-19 school coordinator. Jennifer Thurwood, she is our COVID-19 CD coordinator. You have myself, and then we have Alyssa Caliendo, who is our surveillance specialist. Um, and I'll have to say that our, the team is working exceptionally hard every day. Um, we do get some really, really good questions from schools. And so uh, we are learning more every day as well. Next slide, please. We also have a back to school um, toolkit. Uh, that we have created um, here for from the health department for our schools. Um, if you can click on that image. Uh, hey, uh, April, this is Barb. Uh, do the time. We really don't oh, have I'm time sorry. to go into I the toolkit, please. We can, uh, yeah, just. If, if you send out, it, my PowerPoint is sent out to everyone in attendance. Um, if you click on this actual image, it will show you the toolkit. You'll be able to go through the toolkit. So that's available for you. Uh, but our toolkit just goes through, there's some resources there for them. And then it also talks about when they report a case, what the next steps are. So our schools have provided some great feedback to our school toolkit. And um, as we learn more, we update our school toolkit so that it is most useful to them. Um, we, and they are using it. So uh, we wanna make sure that it is, it continues to be useful for them um, as we continue to learn more and more and more. Next slide, please. And thank you. April, um, this is um, Mrs. Lewis. Um, all the feedback that I have heard from the schools has been very positive um, about the um, association with the health department. And I've heard nothing but how grateful they are to have this resource so close because it, it, is, it is very difficult for school officials to make those decisions because you're, you're talking about um, you know, parents and daycare and um, whether the kids are learning better or not and all that. And so um, I just wanna thank you on behalf of the schools for everything that you guys have been doing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> are there any other questions or comments for April? Hearing none, um, thank you April very much for, uh, for your presentation and for all the work that uh, you and your team do. Um, as uh, Chairman Lewis said, uh, it is really important that uh, the work that you guys are doing are really well received by the schools. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I am going to exit this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. You want to go to the flash report, um, Marcus? Um, in the essence of time, I'm going to quickly go through this. I'm not going to belabor it. Um, I just want to say um, that the health department, uh, even though we we are uh, continuously have the majority of our work is uh, related to COVID, there are other things that we must continue to do to stay certified and accredited. And one of them is to do our community health assessments. If you get a call, please uh, answer that call and do the assessment. This is where we assess our community uh, to determine what our uh, health priorities are within the community. Next slide, please. Um, uh, as you know, during this horrendous time, a lot of people are struggling with mental health issues. Uh, this has caused a drain on a lot of people, those who have uh, diagnosed mental health issues and those who have not. And uh, what we do is a virtual parent cafe, and it gives a lot of resources to those who uh, may be struggling, uh, especially with, uh, with the restrictions we have with visitations to mental health providers. And last but not least, uh, we continue to prepare with COVID, but one of the major things we're preparing now is to be prepared and ready uh, when there is a vaccine that comes and that 
that we are able to distribute our vaccine within our community efficiently and effectively uh, and as quick as we possibly can and for storage. Uh, thank you. So now go to my presentation, please. Um, while we're getting the presentation up, back on the um, health survey, there was a link that people could go in and actually take the survey. Yes. 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 And that's in here too. It's, yeah, um, it's, in, the, it's, it's in the details. Uh, yeah, canehealthcounts.org. If anybody's interested in taking that survey, um, it is important to get as many people in those surveys so we get a good representation of what's going on in the community. Thank you. You're welcome. Next slide, please. Um, as you know, last Friday I announced and we had a press release that uh, Kane County uh, have gone back into the warning level for COVID-19 uh, for two metrics that uh, had exceeded the state uh, standard. Uh, one was positivity rate. You have to be below 50 per 100,000 persons, and we exceeded it. We were up to 114 per 1,000 persons. And then the other one was our death rate. And I'll say this again, our death rate was, uh, it's about 20% exceeding for two consecutive weeks. And when your death rate is low, uh, two deaths in a week could uh, topple that to 20% consecutively. So for two weeks, we had seven. So it, it's not a huge number and I don't want to minimize any deaths. But when you have that metric, like that, that will up your uh, death rate for 20%. But our greatest metric that is the most alarming is our positivity rate that has truly exceeded double the 50 per 100,000 persons. So that happened, no, no, not yet. <laughs> that happened on uh, last Friday, the 16th. And unfortunately on the 20th, uh, that was our county on the Friday. Then on Tuesday, our region went to the warning. So our region uh, went to what's called resurgence mitigation. I provided it here for you, the tiers that uh, the state had developed if a region went. And I remind you, uh, Kane is in region eight and we're in a region with DuPage County. And so that means now the whatever happens is affected by both counties and uh, we go into the tier. Uh, the tiers that I presented to you earlier in the year when the governor put them out is different, a little different and we'll walk through them uh, and I'll show you the changes from what's in tier one and that's where we will be. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that has occurred, if there are three consecutive days greater than 8% test positivity rate for the region of a seven rolling day, that's what causes us to go into resurgence medication, mitigation. And as you can see on the slide, the circle, on uh, October 15th, our region was 8.4. On October 16th, 8.5. And October 17th, 9. That is what caused us to be in resurgence mitigation. And so that's a combination of you take the data from Kane and DuPage and put it together. And this is how you get your three-day rolling data positivity rate over 8%. Next slide, please. So what does that mean? Uh, this is where we get into our mitigation, what's gonna occur. So there's a lot of things that can occur and right now in tier one, what's going to happen? They look at, uh, we're looking at per the governor, this is a directive from the governor and the Illinois Department of Public Health. Uh, it's directed at the bars, restaurants, meeting social events and organized groups. And what's going to happen overall is the bars are all going to close in both counties by 11 p.m. as well as the restaurants. There will be no indoor dining. It's all outdoors as right now. Uh, bar patrons can't be seated uh, inside anymore. Uh, they must be outside at tables. Uh, what's significantly different here, remember we had 10 people at a table. Now you can only have six. You also can't have uh, reservations for each party and you can't have the last bullet and I'll explain it because I didn't understand it at first. No seating of multiple parties at one time. And I thought, well, what does that mean? And what that means is if you're not in the same household, you can't go sit down together. So uh, unfortunately, Chairman Laws and you and I can't go to dinner together, sorry. <laughs> So that's what that means. So um, so if you have a part, remember it was a party of 10, now it's a party of six, now it's your own family or those who live in your household. So that's the difference. I wasn't sure and I had to call the state and to explain that. 
So uh, in a restaurant, again, as I said, they'll close at 11, no indoor dining, tables still have to be six feet, that's still the same, and reservations are required, and, uh, and that keeps people from being stacked up outside in line, that's why they're requiring reservations, and of course, uh, no multiple parties at one table. Now, when the meeting, this one, you say meeting, social events and gatherings, these are our banquet halls, our private functions that people have. Remember, it was 50 people or 50%. Now it's 25 people at 50% of overall room capacity. Uh, I thought this one was interesting because I didn't realize it was on there. No party buses. So, uh, but uh, and casinos and gamings are closing at 11. And again, they have a 25% capacity as well. Our organized group recreational, which is our fitness center and sports, there are no changes, no, no sports guidance as of yet. Now, what does that mean for us? That means we have not shut down totally. That's what that means. But that means if we don't reduce our positivity rate, we will in the, enter into the next tier of mitigation, which is even more restrictive. So I say we all contribute to uh, pushing this backwards so we don't find ourselves in a, in a uh, more restrictive environment because let's face it, that affects our schools, that'll affect our workplace, and it definitely will have an economic impact on our community. And nobody wants that. So we really need to do what it takes so we don't have that in our community. As Rachel gave you the indication, we've been working really hard with our schools to keep our schools in. And as you, you heard her say, we are finding things like uh, the uh, private sporting clubs are ones who are contributing to the spread, not our schools. And so we wanna keep our schools open. We wanna keep our businesses open. So we all just have to wait for a while to go out with each other as friends, but we still have the ability to go out and let's do it safely. Next slide, please. Uh, if there's no question, oh, oh, so one of the things we just started getting, and uh, I really want to say the CARES Act has really, funding has really provided us the opportunity to do some great things, and one is contact tracing and giving us better data that we would never be able to have, and so what one of the things we're fortunate to have right now is to identify the 10 top high uh, cases in Kane County. And the data is smaller after it gets 10. So each month I will be able to show you for the past month who has the highest case counts per, per municipality. And for the month of September, we have Aurora, Elgin, St. Charles, Carpentersville, Geneva, South Elgin, Batavia, Algonquin, Hampshire, and Montgomery, having the highest case count for that month. And I will be providing that to you every month now that we have this. So what I'll do, what you'll find, there's a trend and you'll find what that trend is and we can work better and closer with those municipalities. And before we didn't have access to this data, thanks to our, uh, our company that we're working on. So now that we have this data, we can narrow in to find out where our hotspots are, what, what communities are really ramping up, what communities are, are you know, doing well, and how do we work those communities who are struggling? Next slide. Is it also by zip code? That we can get yes, data. yes. Uh, I, I will say this. I'm glad you asked that. All of the data that I show you, it is by zip code because, because remember, we have two municipalities that have other counties within them, and we do not uh, show their data. So, you know, in Aurora has three, in Elgin has three, and we only look at the data that's uh, in King County, for King County residents per zip code. You're absolutely right. So uh, this slide, what I want to share you, this is another slide that uh, we are thanks to our vendor. So this is about age groups. And what I want to draw your attention is to that yellow bar. Over 40% of our positivity rates are in the 20 and 29 year olds. That's what that bar represents. If you go to the left of that bar, uh, the orange bar, um, for those of you who are colorblind, <laughs> The orange bar is represents 528. And then you go to the right of that, the green bar are the 30 year olds, the next bar, the 40 and the 50 year olds. So they're all hovering in the 500 range. But look at that 20 to 29 year old. They are way up over 800 cases. So what does that say to you? That's the young group, that's the healthy group, that's the high risk group. And they're the ones who are driving up our positivity rate. 
And so we ask that they really look at their behaviors. Those are the ones we anticipate are in, in social groups. In, uh, you know, they're going e either in small or large groups. They're going to the bars. They're hanging out because, you know, those are the young people. We were all there once. We were all there. So those are the groups we really have to uh, work with in reducing the positivity rate. Now, are they the healthy group? Absolutely. Absolutely. But the problem is, is when they come back into the community, they raise our rates. Do we really, even though you're healthy, you're contributing to making restrictions in our community and keeping our economy potentially uh, shut down. And that's what we want to say to those groups. Please wear your mask. Please social distance. We don't want our community shut down because you're having a good time. We don't want people not to uh, socialize. We want to be uh, come out of this as healthy as possible and not have all these restrictions because it's, it's, it's challenging for all of us. We all have COVID fatigue. I will tell you, the health department is not an exception. We all have COVID fatigue, and we don't want this to go on any longer than we have to, but we have to have that group help us do that so we don't run into tier two of this uh, uh, mitigation resurgence, because I think it, it's, it'll be really a hardship for our community, and we have a community that always works together and try to take care of our, each other, so uh, that's my um, plea to all of you and to your respective communities. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, and then, as always, I try to provide you the contact tracing information milestone. Uh, so totally, we've done uh, over close to 14,000 calls. We continue to get 100% of our calls in what's Salesforce, that's the platform that goes out to do contact tracing. We have an average daily calls of 500. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for allowing us to have the CARES Act money because I have 60 plus people. There is no way we can average 500 calls a day. There is just no way we can do that. And we're trying to find people. And that's where we stop the spread when we find people and say, you know, you need to get tested. You need to stay home. And so this is what the impact of having our uh, contact tracing. And then the last uh, is what's called refusal rate. 5.6% uh, of that population that we call refuses to talk to us. That's what that means. So they either say, no, I'll tell you my information, but I won't pass on my friends, or no, I don't talk to you at all. So we have to track all of that. All that data goes into the data for IDPH. So each community is tracking all of that. So that's what the refusal rate is. So um, that's what I have for you today. Um, oh, sure. So I'll take questions. Excuse me, Madam Chairman. Unfortunately, I have to uh, be on a uh, call uh, a few minutes before 10 o'clock. So uh, first of all, I appreciate what this committee is doing uh, during this very hard time. Uh, Ms. Jeffers, uh, it's, you're an inspiration uh, when it comes to your endurance and your competence and your team's competence. I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. Um, do you each month take a look, and actually each day, uh, take a look at, I mean, positivity rate is one thing, uh, you know, cases versus tests. By the way, in just definition, if I test with antibodies, I hear that that's counted as a positive case uh, because perhaps I, I would have had it at some point, but antibodies is a good thing. Is that true or is that just a rumor? You know, kind of. I, I will look that one up. I've not heard that ever, that uh, if you test positive with antibodies that, because that's a different lab. Um, I would think so. Yeah, so good, I'll, I'll look that up. Okay, it, it seems that the most important thing, and especially with the a very good chart of what ages folks are, and as you point out, they're health, you know, the healthiest, strongest, but I know that when folks come back home, they go and visit uh, elderly, um, you know, that, that's where risks take place. The seriousness uh, of these cases, uh, hospitalization and deaths, uh, do we go through uh, those stats too? Absolutely. I don't go through every single stat, but I will give you this information okay. here. Um, 
Up until last week, we averaged one or two hospitalizations in our county. Last week, we were at 24. So we have seen an increasing surge, uh, uh, an alarming, I will say the hospital shared with us, an alarming surge in our hospitalizations. And what does that mean? It's a trickle down effect. If they have 24 cases in COVID, then they can't treat other things like heart disease and other chronic illness that may come through. So. And, and yes. I came I came today uh, to learn and also to uh, uh, support you in uh, as far as the bars and restaurants, it is a tragedy. Uh, jobs are evaporating, life savings evaporating. It is death to a whole industry and it doesn't come back. Um, uh, but I understand that you are uh, pushing back as much as you are allowed to do by state law and state decree, which I don't believe that a governor has uh, that kind of power uh, over a nine month, but you know, cases or courts decide that I don't. Uh, but the pushing back as much as possible on keeping our children in school. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I understand that some are hybrid, um, just this morning, I wake up to uh, an interview with a person who is just, he, he was, he and his family were trying to uh, be active with school boards and that kind of thing in the Chicago area. And he's finally given up and they're just moving to Indiana for, for the schools. I mean, 145,000 people over a, a four or five year period of time net have left our state. We're losing uh, all those human resources and if we're just mercenary about it, all those tax dollars, which means that the rest of us who are here uh, pay more, uh, but now says, I am not going to stunt my children's growth uh, by uh, you know, having suboptimal. But from what I understand, and I didn't get it so much from April's presentation, uh, but I, I believe that you are uh, working as hard as you can to keep schools open. I know that that has to be healthy, but that is a big deal. And we're all very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have a couple of questions. So are we fully staffed on the contact tracing now? Or are we still hiring? Okay, contact tracing works like this. So where we are, we're fully staffed. We hired a company. One of our criteria was to ramp up quickly and ramp down quickly based on the numbers. So when our positivity goes up, yes. And how you can determine your uh, level of employment is the return on those calls. We are able to return every call within 24 hours before it took longer. And so, yes, so we have, we have, our, we are at the level of staffing required right now. And if, as our positivity rate goes up, we'll have to hire more. And as it goes down, because if nobody's there to call, why would you have people hire? So that's why we want to ramp up and ramp down. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question that I got from a constituent is, we lost our um, epidemiologist. Yes. Okay. We've what? Lost several <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, he went on to a, a better job, which is great. We like that when people move up, but yet we don't. It hurts us. What? What? What do you think the time frame is going to be to replace that? So we can't wait to get someone replaced. We we're in the process of hiring. So what we do is we shift staff who have some of the knowledge to, there are some critical uh, work, there's critical work that has to be covered by staff and one is our data. We have to have that data going. And so it's not like only one person knows how to do the data, but they're not epidemiologists. So we, we work to make sure the uh, most important port parts that those uh, jobs are done until we can hire. So uh, in terms of uh, onboarding, I can't tell you that. It's a matter of you know getting applications out, people uh, applying. Uh, this has been a trend in uh, public health across the country. Some people just can't take it anymore and they're jumping ship all over. This is not unique to Kane. And then others, because these are good opportunities. You get good people to come in. Uh, all those people April listed, other than her, everybody was new, but they're temporary employees still. 
you know, because they're COVID funded. So, but they were all able to come just like the contact tracers, because these are opportunities as we all know, this has had an economic impact. So if you've lost a job, this is your great opportunity to, to find a job. And the nice thing about our uh, epidemiologists, that's a full-time position versus if I called you today, October and say, you only can work to December, you probably wouldn't take that job. So that's the nice thing. This is a already um, a budgeted position for the health department. All right, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Weber. Thank you. Um, Director Jeffers, I have a question. When um, someone tests positive, right? They go for the test, they test positive. A lot of employers are saying, hey, you can come back once you test negative. People are getting three, four, five tests done. So if they do that within a two week period, does each one of those times they test positive count as a new case? I believe it does. And I don't want to say it does. I don't, I don't think, because you would have to have a name associated with that test. So let me double check that before I give you that answer. Um, so you're saying people are multiple testing. They're going like rapidly going to get this Every test. single person I know that has had COVID has had three or four tests because they want to be able to- In a row? Back. Yes, they want to be able to get back to work or the employer is saying you got to test negative. Okay. Telling the kids to, and the family to go get tested. I mean, there's so much over testing going on. So negative test does not allow you to return to work. I'm a just, if you test positive, you have a, between a 10 and 14 day isolation period, period because you are going to, the viral load hasn't gone away because you test it, right? I the understand virus, that, yes. Right, the virus has to go out of your body, so getting a negative test or keep testing is not going to help um, you move forward to work, and employers should not be allowing folks who test positive to return to work. There are criteria for returning work, no symptoms, and if you are asymptomatic, that's when you do your 10 isolation day, no fever. So there, there's a whole criteria, and just because you get a negative test does not mean that you can return to work if you haven't followed the criteria of the guidance that uh, allows us to return to work. But the question about the multiple tests, I need to look that one up. Yes, I, I think I'm afraid that that's a lot of what yeah, is happening. I, I agree with, with um, Mr. Weber, because I've heard the same thing from various employers that um, as soon as you get that negative test and you don't have a fever, those are the two that they're checking. Bring us that negative test and don't, you know, when we... I, I would encourage... In the morning, those are the two that, that businesses... And, and a lot of employers are, they're saying, listen, because they want their employee to come back to work. Yes. They're paying for them to get another rapid test. Mm -hmm. Well, I would encourage all of you to have uh, the employer and the person to call the health department if they're unsure about the guidance, because um, what happens is you can have a low viral load and go back to work and then you're still infectious and then now you have an outbreak at your workplace. Um, so just having that does not help um, reduce the spread. And I, and I get it, we all wanna get back to work but if we're running around in groups and going to states that have high positivity rates. Sure, no, it becomes just a livelihood thing. People, mm -hmm. the employers need the employees there. Employees need to go there to, to make money. So it just, it's starting to create but, a lot well, of issues. No one has been unscathed by this, even the health department. It is devastating when you can't have an employee for 14 days, it really shuts down business, no matter what the business is, whether it's a school, the health department, the county, I mean, this impacts us all. It's really hard when your employee's home and they've been exposed. It's, it's, it's so challenging. And the difference is all the people you just mentioned, they continue to get paid. Private sector, there's just things that people are talking to me about. Right. Obviously. Private sector, a lot of those people do not. Right. It's different. The, the hourly employees that work in those food packaging industries. Sure. Are very they they want to get back to work and the employers want to get them back to work as quick as possible, and and I I totally understand that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Sanchez, what's next, and then Mr. Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just a couple of questions. One, I think it was it was sort of roundabout brought up with the epidemiologist mm -hmm. that we don't have right now. I've heard a lot of complaint. Really, the only complaint I've heard from residents is that the the numbers on our website aren't up to date. 
And I, I believe that had to do with the epidemiologist position. Is that correct? What I understand is we, uh, so the person that was put in charge to update that did not realize that it was being updated on the weekends. So it wasn't it an update, it wasn't posted. Now I will say this, the numbers for Kane County data and a lot of residents complain about this. The data on our website and the data on the state website does not match because mm -hmm. of when you post the data. Data is always posted at a point in time. So if I post my data every day at 4.30 and something happens between 4.30 and midnight, the state's gonna post a different number. And so that's the problem with trying to uh, manage the data side by side. So our data is, and our data is only Gang County's data. And we post it at a certain time every single day because you have to have a cutoff. You can't just like every five minutes enter the data. We have a, a cutoff. And once that cutoff happens, the data gets counted the next day. Whereas the state's cutoff is different than ours. Okay, I just wanted it out there because it, no, it no. comes up. It comes yeah, up. no, no, I got a question this morning from a gentleman who's challenging the state's data. I don't, I don't post the state's data and I can't explain the state's data. The state has to explain how, why they post the numbers they post. When we went to our first orange, the state and we had different data points and I'll give you a, a real specific answer. When we had our death rates, we didn't have the number of deaths. So the state posts death rates according to the day they receive them. So if you died from COVID, and you weren't tested. So now you gotta have an autopsy. So if you died on October 1st and the state doesn't receive your autopsy to October 7th, they post it on October 7th. The health department posted on the day you're deceased. So we have different criteria for putting data. And it is, it is very confusing. I will not, I will not deny that. It is so complicated and so confusing, but we try to work with our community with, um, you know, trying to explain to each person that calls us to say, why is the data not aligning? But we don't ever, ever uh, identify or try to explain the state's data because we don't work for the state and I don't wanna give uh, wrong information. We can only uh, explain our data. Thank you. Um, my second question, a few weeks ago, our numbers were pretty low uh, relatively, and we were seeing a surge now, it shot up. Some people are uh, attributing that to a large rally for a presidential candidate that happened here. But we've seen all kinds of protests and things throughout the year that didn't seem to increase our numbers. So I know there was an investigation going on with that. Is there any new information that So the about? information is only as good as that's reported, okay? I will say that. So uh, those who were at that rally, we have no one admitting that they were there who tested positive. Just like when people, uh, go to weddings. They don't always admit that they were in these weddings. So we cannot just use one group and, and you know, stigmatize the other group. So when people aren't honest in the contact tracing, we have a very hard challenge in figuring out, you know how we typically find out? People call us and, and anonymously tell us what's going on and that's how we figure it out. Uh, we have parents who don't want to share what other parents and when the kids are in these sporting goods because they don't want to shut down the teams and things like that. So we have a lot of situations and currently we don't have any data to support our spike is attributed to one thing. What we do know our spike is being attributed to these groups, various groups, and not just one group, a lot of groups, uh, small groups and large groups. So right now I cannot substantially say one incident has spiked our data, and you're right, we are trending up. And, and let me identify that by saying, if you look across our state, we're all trending up, and you didn't have those rallies in all those communities. We are all trending up. And I'm not saying it didn't, I'm just saying when we don't mask up and we go in any group, it increases our positivity rate. Thank you. Good morning and thank you. I just to build on what Mr. Weber commented on, it stinks whether if you're the employee or the employer. Um, in transportation, we're deemed essential. On my railroad, if you test positive, you can you can feel just fine. You can be asymptomatic. You can go out and get your own test after you've tested positive a few days later and be just fine. We're off for 14 days. We're paid for four. 
that hurts. Even if even if someone feels okay and, and they may pass some of the base criterion that should allow them to go back, we can't and we get paid for four of the 14. So that really hurts. Um, the question I had for Director Jeffers, and I guess it would be part and parcel with, with uh, April's presentation too, is where does our contact tracing program at the county intersect with some of the schools that have their own program? Are there, is there any overlap? Are they relying on the county to do that work for them? Or are we, do we trust the way they're doing it? Do they, do they trust the way we're doing it? Is there an overlap or an intersection there? There's an alignment. There's no overlap, there's an alignment. So what happens with contact tracing, they do what's pretty much like the preliminary work. So they get the information because we can't wait till you go down and get a test and get positive. That's the traditional way contact tracing works. You get a positive, we get your name, we call you. Well, the school already knows you're, you turn positive, you're an employee at the school and you're at home. So then the school will work with us and say, Barb's tested positive. So here's her name and number and the health department immediately calls you. We don't wait till you go down and get your test and get the, uh, um, the results of your test or your family's test. We begin to trace everybody in your family to find out you know, where you've been, where what's going on or what we call exposure. The other thing is, so, so you test positive and you're in this room with everybody. We don't wait till everybody's test comes in. We start the tracing right away. And that's where the schools assist us. We, and so they'll give me my name and I'll say, oh yeah, I was next to my Kenyan. And so then they call him and, and because Mike hasn't gone to, to, to get a test and he may not even know he was exposed. So that's where the schools help. We work in alignment with each other. We don't work opposite or in conjunction. We work, we work very uh, close together to try to close the gap because there's a period of time when you get your tests and your test results. And that's valuable time lost if we don't get get you in between that and before the contact tracing. If they're calling 500 a day with my workforce, there's no way we could have accommodate that in 24 hours. Um, any questions on the phone? Um, Alan, I no. have a question. Adam, can you, oh, can you tell me? Can you tell me what the difference is? Sometimes it's 10 days and sometimes it's 14 days. Um, are the, are, is that, <laughs> I don't understand why it would not always be 14 days. Because each situation is different. If it's 10 days that there's a high probability you have tested positive and you have symptoms. And so now you're waiting for your symptoms to expire. It's 14 days you've been exposed and your test, if you test, you may have come back negative, but you have up till that. The research and the science is showing you can have up to day 13 before you get a symptom or become uh, positive. So that's the difference between the 10 and the 14 day. Average uh, viral load in folks are between five and seven days, but the research and the science have shown you can test positive and not be negative up until day 13. And so that's where the 14 days comes in. So typically your 14 day people are people who are exposed and not positive. Thanks, Barb, that's real helpful. You know what also would be helpful would be if there were some way, you know, we have our 50, our 50 laboratories. We talk about um, how it'd be possible to uh, try different things and see what works. What would be kind of spectacular would be if we had some place where everybody committed to doing the, the mask thing, like like let's say you know ninety eight percent, and and then we'd have a way of knowing if that works. I, for all the people who say masks don't work, if we had a, a test scenario where we said we tried it and it does work then we would know it did. And if it didn't, then you know all the naysayers would be right and we'd have to go on and then try, figure, try to figure out something else like getting the vaccine or something. But it would just be so great if there were a way to get that, get that data from, a, from a, a, a legitimate test. I wish there were a way to do that. I wish Kane County could do that. <laughs> Not sure if I have... Uh... The ability to do that. May I chime in? This is Dr. Silva. Sure, go ahead. 
thank you. I think that's a that's a great idea. I think um, if there were a way to do that, certainly it would be um, just a very streamlined scientific way of proving something. The only thing is, how do you prove something um, that cannot be proved? There's there's in science and public health and medicine, there's a scientific method, and so there's a, um, a streamlined way to do things. And I think with mass, what we're saying is, or what I hear the um, scientists saying is that we can decrease um, our our exposure, but I I just we, there's no way. Even if you wear a mask, you're still exposed because the germ um, can enter through other membranes. So even if you're wearing a mask, it could still enter through your through your eyes. So we're not actually getting rid of all um, <clears throat> all of the um, exposure, but we're just minimizing or, or mitigating it is my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Silva. Uh, Deb, one of the things they have proved, and I, because I'm not a sport enthusiast, but one of the sporting teams, when they put them all in the bubble, so there was no exposure, uh, they all, nobody t turned positive, and I can't remember if it was baseball, basketball, or one of them. Okay, there uh, you go. <laughs> I remember hearing about the bubble business, and, and you're right, it's tricky, because somebody goes out and plays with their family or something and messes up the bubble. But, so uh, but you're that's right. Exposure. That's it's about exposure and not knowing who you're exposed to. And so if you keep your family groups together, then you have a, a limit uh, exposure. And Dr. Uh, Silva is correct. It can enter in through your eyes and you're not protected. So the mask does minimize. It doesn't totally uh, keep you 100% safe, but it sure does minimize the exposure because it's airborne. So, um, but if you stay close within your bubble, you have a, a limited, um, even a greater potential of not being exposed and getting the virus as proven by the hockey and basketball. Right. Thank sure. you. This is Deborah again. I I'm just want. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Deborah. I'm going to with a question. Uh, sometimes it shows on my screen, and sometimes it doesn't. So I'm I'm not sure if you can hear me. Uh, what I wanted to say was that um, because of my husband, of course, I'm trying to be really careful, and and I'm lucky in that I can kind of limit to where I I go. So I'm not doing uh, the big gatherings by any means. I'm just kind of proud of the fact that when I do go to the grocery store, I see everybody in masks. And, um, and yet I ran into uh, you know, just a couple of very polite, uh, probably, probably late 20 year old guys just out in front of my house who said, who's, who said, no, we're not wearing masks because, you know, every time there's an election, they come up with some disease, um, 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 Ebola or, or something. And I said, yeah, but, you know, here we are and we're doing pretty well, but what happens when we go home? What about your grandma? And it, and it just didn't make a dent. But at least in the grocery stores and the pharmacies, um, I can report in, in Elgin, in my limited experience, people are wearing the masks fiercely. And that's, that's just great. Thank you. Uh, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm just going to say, in the interest of time, because oh. we are already 20 yeah. minutes past this and there's another meeting waiting to start, um, unless there's something extremely critical that somebody needs to share, I'd like to get on and finish up this meeting. If you have something, a question, please feel free to either send it to me or to send it to Barbara. And, um, um, you know, thanks for all the participation. Okay, so anyway, um, I need a, we have um, no old business. I need a motion to replace the reports on file. Mr. Weber, Mr. Kenyon, um, roll call. Ms. Allen? Allen, I. Kenyon? Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Silva? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weber? Yes. Yes. All right. Passes. Um, no need for an executive session. No new business today. We've covered a lot of new stuff. 
And um, no public comments. I need a motion to observe, to adjourn. And that is Mr. Kenyon, seconded by Mr. Weber, and we can do a voice call on this one. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. All right. Thank you Aye. very much. Meeting adjourned. For everybody online, we will be going into the legislative meeting. We need a couple of minutes here to reset everything, uh, but we will use this room. So feel free to stick around Over if there. you want to attend that meeting. <laughs> Thank you.